trigger warning. This podcast is about grief. Whether you are newly bereaved or whether you have been stuck in grief for years, I do hope this podcast brings you some comfort. Grief is such a universal experience, but we all do it differently. This podcast is not about fixing you or forcing the healing process because there is no cure for grief. It can only be absorbed, experienced, loved and cared for. So whether you are doing it privately behind closed doors or like me, you are kicking and screaming your way through, let's support each other. This is a safe space where we can come together and share experiences. My hope is that this podcast shines a light on your path and gives you the strength to navigate your way through the grieving process. My name is Louise Bates and I'm so pleased we connected. I'm looking forward to interviewing people who have also walked this path to find out what worked for them in the hope that it helps you too. I'm sending you so much love and support and I look forward to sharing this crazy journey with you. Welcome to this episode of A Gift for Grief and today my guest is Louise Bennett. Louise is mother to Fred who died from leukaemia in May 2020 and his younger brother Arthur. She writes on her blog blanketsandbiscuits.com and is currently writing her first book. Writing has always been her passion and she has found it a vital way to come to terms with her grief and to find a way forward. She set up Fred Bennett's Don't Look Down, a special named fund with the Children's Cancer and Leukaemia Group, to raise funds for research into acute lymphoblastic leukaemia, which is about to break the £100,000 fundraising mark. She has written articles on grief for the Huffington Post and the New Statesman and appeared as a contributor on Newsnight, BBC Breakfast, Good Morning Britain, ITV News, Sky News and Global Radio. By day, she runs Armadillo Social, a marketing and training agency. I first connected with Louise many years ago when I discovered she was doing a course on how to use social media. It was being held at the local college and I signed up, but unfortunately I had to cancel my place because my son Matthew was admitted into hospital and that's when my nightmare began. Then a few years later I heard that Louise's son was very poorly and I found myself invested in her journey. Although we'd never met, I was willing and praying her son Fred would get better because I didn't want her to go through what I'd been through. However, sadly, that was not to be. We're both in the same club, a club that no one wants to join. We've both lost a child and here we are today meeting for the first time. So welcome, Louise, and thank you for being on my podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you. Now, I feel I have a deep connection with others who have gone through a significant loss. It feels like there's a cord or deep understanding linking us together in some sort of comforting bond. Do you feel this too? Oh, absolutely. And I think I have now lots of friends who've also lost their children. And I think we have a sort of shorthand of speaking and we have a a kind of way of talking that we just understand that other people don't. Uh, We do uh, sort of refer to people who haven't lost their children as muggles in this way, that there's just an under, there's just an understanding. And even, and uh, this was pure coincidence, but I was watching a documentary a couple of, um, a couple of weeks ago and one of the people at the end died. Uh, But one of the main interviewees was his father and I said right at the beginning, well, he's died. Yeah. And all of my friends afterwards was like, how did you know that? And I said, I, as soon as his dad started speaking, yeah, you could, you could tell. So, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I definitely feel that as well. I feel like um, with people that haven't experienced it, they feel uncomfortable. But there's, there's, there is an understanding, isn't there, in this club that we belong to. 
so definitely. So for people who don't know your story, Louise, could you tell us what life was like for you and your family before Fred died and the events that led up to his diagnosis? So, I mean, we were just a, you know, we were just a normal family. Um, Having two boys, that it was very boisterous, it was very loud. Fred, in particular, was uh, a very action-packed, high-adrenaline boy. You couldn't take your eyes off him because he'd (laughs) never be in the same place. Um, And he was always doing ridiculously stupid things things um he was always going too fast he was always climbing trees yeah it, it was it was yeah it was action-packed so I was always really worried that something would happen to him uh but I am but in a broken bones you know yeah stitched knees that kind of thing so his diagnosis came as a real shock and about three or four weeks earlier he'd broken his shoulder at school and it was in a sort of lunchtime rugby game um, which wasn't at all surprising that they'd just been too rough and he'd broken his shoulder. So he was not himself, but there were lots of reasons why we were thinking that he wasn't himself. So he was, you know, he was in pain. He wasn't sleeping as well as he should. He wasn't getting the, he needed a lot of exercise. So he wasn't getting that. Yeah. So there were lots of things why we sort of could explain why he wasn't really himself. But I would say that it was only really a week before his diagnosis that he wasn't very well. But also it was July, so it was the end of term. Yeah. It was like, oh, everybody's not themselves at the end of term. And he um, he got sent home from school on the Friday because he wasn't very well. And then on the Saturday, we went to a village fete and he wasn't very well. And he fell asleep at a friend's house, which w- was unheard of. But we were a little bit like, oh, you'll be fine, you know, you'll be fine. And then on the Sunday, I uh, had tickets to the Barbara Streisand in Hyde Park. And I did that whole, and his glands were up. So I thought he had glandular fever, which would make total sense. Yeah. So um, I said to my husband, in a very big girl's pants way, he'll be fine. You can look after him. I'm off to Barbara Streisand. So off I went to Barbara Streisand. And I remember texting my husband the poster for sepsis and telling him that maybe it was that because he had a broken bone. Yeah. So we should probably take him to the GP in the morning. So I was staying in London overnight. My husband took him to the GP, uh, the GP, which is the only time my husband's ever taken them to the doctors. Um, My husband took him to the GP. The GP said it was almost certainly glandular fever. But he'd run some blood tests just to confirm it. So we um, so my husband took him for the blood tests. And then I was in uh, Trafalgar Square in on the Monday afternoon. And uh, I got a phone call from the hospital saying you need to bring him to A&E now. And I was like, I'm in the middle of London. So my husband took him to A&E. I rushed back on the train and then they diagnosed him with leukaemia. So then. when they phoned you, you didn't know what you were dealing with? No. So I still thought, actually, it was probably sepsis. Yeah. Um, no, had no idea. So it was only when I, yeah, only when I got off the train and got to the hospital that they said it was leukaemia. And then he was admitted. He was transferred to Birmingham the next day and his chemotherapy started the next day. So from being sent home from school on Friday because yeah. he was feeling a bit under the weather to the Monday, that was um, That is unbelievable, that was it. isn't it? I mean, so he was only 14 years old. How did you and your family cope with such devastating news? And did Fred understand the severity of his situation? I think, I think you cope, um, I think you cope in the only way that you can in that you just sort of go into survival mode. Yeah. So he was, thir- he was 13 when he was diagnosed and he was 14 when he died. But he had a good understanding, but also... It's one of those things where you you take the information that you can absorb and you disregard the rest. So, and also it was one of those things which you look back on now and think, oh. So it was one of those things also that they call leukaemia the good cancer. Leukaemia is a good one to have because nine out of ten children uh, go into remission. Yeah. So you think, oh, well, that's good. Yeah. 
It um, gives you that hope, doesn't it? Abso- absolutely. And so it was very kind of, no, this is fine. We will take it all in our stride. We can do this. So, And also because it was such a shock diagnosis, there was that kind of Avengers Assemble of friends coming to help. Yeah. And there was such a lot to do that I think we didn't really have time to process what that actually uh, what that actually meant. Yeah, yeah. So how did you find his treatments and how did he cope with his treatments? Um, he actually coped with his treatments really well um, in that Fred had always been a really robust child. So we always used to joke that he was sort of a bit like Jason Bourne, that he didn't really feel pain and he didn't really get yeah. tired. Um, so he actually coped with his his treatments really well. Uh, he was on steroids at the beginning and steroids, are, everyone is really frightened about chemotherapy, but steroids were hideous because they just made him really quiet. Okay. And they just made him not himself. Yeah. So so they were a bit, um, they were a bit rough. But on the whole, he coped with the, his first block of chemotherapy really well. But ultimately, that's because it didn't work. So, and I... And in that way that, you know, when you were pregnant and if you had morning sickness, people would say, oh, no, that's a sign of a strong pregnancy. (laughs) And Fred didn't really have any side effects from the chemotherapy. And I was like, is that good? Is that bad? Is that completely unconnected? Um, But essentially after his first, there's quite a strict regime for leukemia. There's like a a process stages that you go through. So after the first stage... It hadn't um, it hadn't done what it should have done. So he was put on to a more intense treatment. And then that intense treatment didn't work either. And so then he then they just had to keep coming up with new plans and new things to work. So in terms of how he coped with his treatment, it was just it was just changing all the time because every time they'd come up with a new plan that of something that that might work and then that plan would have to change um but from so he was diagnosed in july 2019 but from probably the end of november beginning of december he was pretty much an inpatient in birmingham while they thought of new things uh new treatments to give him so at what point louise did you realize that fred wasn't going to get better well, the thing is, we never really did. And I look back now and think, actually, they tried to tell us and we didn't maybe. Not that we didn't listen, but right from the very beginning, I would said to the doctors, I don't want you to give me statistics. So the whole nine in ten, well, it doesn't yeah. matter because I've only got one. So it doesn't matter whether it's one in ten, one in a hundred, yeah. one in a thousand. Absolutely, yeah. I'm only bothered about the one, so don't tell me. So I think as those statistics got narrower and narrower, I still didn't want to know. As long as there was a chance that he could get better, yeah. that was what we would focus on. So he had a new treatment called CAR T-cell therapy, Um, in Great Ormond Street in April 2020 and they told us that it was highly unlikely that it would work because it need the leukemia levels need to be quite low for it to work and Fred's were really high and they said they'd never done CAR T-cell therapy on a child with leukemia levels as high as Fred's but if we wanted to do it they'd give it a go And so we were like, well, of course we're going to give it a go. We're not going to say no. And also, this is Fred. If there was a boy that was going to be the one that um, that would be the first, then it would be him. So really, there was always a chance that he could get better. Yeah. Until he died. And it's one of those things where you say that we are all in the same club, but there are such divisions of that club. And... And obviously, you know, we talked to Fred that and, you know, we tried to talk to him about the fact that he might not get better. But in that, I don't know how you do it. I I don't have experience of that, of no. being told that your child is never going to get better and having to have that conversation with your child. I don't know what that's like because I never had to do it. And it's not 
that one's better than the other. You know, it's like, do you want to be stabbed or shot? Yeah. But it's, I think it's, it, it yeah, it's different. Yeah. And so I, and, the, and whether we were deluded or just optimistic, I think we always had that idea that he might get better. And I resonate with that totally because Matthew was, he just turned 25 years old when he was diagnosed and his prognosis was very poor from the start and he was told that chemotherapy and radiotherapy wouldn't work for his type of cancer and we were told it would just be a matter of time. So, you know, they did tell us. But I didn't want to have a time scale. Matthew, you know, we didn't we just didn't talk about that because we held on to this hope that some people just go into remission for no reason at all. And Matthew could be that person. And Matthew, you can be a pioneer for your cancer type. And we're going to do all of these alternative and complementary treatments. And we threw everything at it. But, you know, doesn't every cancer patient just need that hope? Yeah, absolutely. And especially when it's a child I think you know yeah. if, it, if you're an older person who has lived their life you can say well yeah. you know I've had a good innings I've yeah. done what I've needed to do and you know maybe I don't want to try this revolutionary new treatment yeah. but when you're 13 yeah. there's no way of saying no actually absolutely yeah so do you feel that your grief started before Fred died or was it in your face when he died was it just because for me, I felt about a month before he died, he needs a miracle. I can't save him. All of this stuff we're doing. And then I felt I started to grieve for him. And it's, it's a, it's, there's a name for it. It's called anticipatory grief, where you start the grieving process before the person dies. And it's normally when somebody's been given a limiting uh, a terminal diagnosis. Um, but for some people, you know, you can be given this, have that hope. It's always going to be a shock. I mean, even though I pre was prepared for it, I knew his death was imminent. Nothing can prepare you for the moment they take their last breath. But did you f experience any grief before he died, do you think? I think, uh, actually, I've just finished watching, I've just finished watching Succession and uh, Roman Roy said he pre-grieved, which um, I think is the same sort of thing. Um, I... So no, because I say I did just think that he would get better. But I think there was a definite point where um, basically lots of from about March onwards, things started to just go wrong. And I think I realised then that Fred, if Fred survived and recovered, that he was not going to be the same. You know, the things that had happened to his body. Yeah he'd had a seizure which they said he would fully recover from but it wasn't quite clear that he would so he was just going to be changed he wasn't going to just go back to normal so I think there was a certain um there was a certain amount of grief about that and I think also I think there's I think there's sort of so many channels of grief and I think there's a definite grief for the life we had yes and that I think is really hard so you so I think you start you can grieve a person after they've died yeah. but before that I think you grieve the life that you had before that yeah. is never going to be the same again no now you also had to cope with the backdrop of lockdown restrictions how did this impact your day-to-day -day generally with hospital visits and treatments and so on I mean, I'll be honest, it was just awful. And I, I, it's only now actually um, that I realise how awful it was because at the time you're just dealing with whatever throws yeah. at you. But I think we were in this really awful and stressful situation that just had layers of complication added on top. So the main issue was that we couldn't all be together. Yeah. So we had managed, Fred was in Birmingham Children's Hospital and we had managed with one of the, um, what tended to happen was that I would do two nights, then John would do one night, but we'd spend a lot of time in the hospital room together. Arthur would spend a lot of time coming to visit. We could sort of be a family yeah. in the hospital. But when COVID restrictions um, happened, then um, 
that could that couldn't happen. So I think the first thing was that Arthur wasn't allowed in the hospital. So that was really difficult. And also, uh, John and I weren't allowed in the hospital at the same time. Right. So we could swap over, but we weren't allowed in the hospital at the same time. So we managed that. And also, because there was the whole thing about bubbles, Arthur had been being looked after when we were in the hospital by my sister. But then we were really confused about how we broke that bubble. So if he was with my sister, were we allowed to see him? And it was like that sort of fox and the chicken in the bag of grain of how you could work this system. And I remember trying to talk to my doctor, talk to Fred's doctors about it and them saying, which became quite laughable with the whole sort of Dominic Cummings testing his eyesight. Yeah. Um, she said, when they talk about special circumstances, that's you. That those are the circumstances that they're talking about. Yeah. But in the end, we came to a solution where Arthur would stay with us. And I mean, poor Arthur would have to drive to the hospital, wait in the car while we swapped over and then drive home again. And we did that. I can't remember how long it was for, but it probably wasn't, you know, it probably wasn't very long. And then Fred uh, got COVID. And so we were taken to this sort of isolation ward and uh, we were able to be, I was able to be with him, but um, I wasn't allowed to leave the room for 10 days. Oh my goodness, so, Louise. So we could all go, so so I could be there, but yeah, I couldn't leave the room. Yeah. And I was allowed to leave the room. It was basically, if I was allowed to leave, it was bad because I was allowed to leave the room once to have a chat with the doctor outside who basically said Fred Lu- Fred's leukemia levels were so high that he could, um, that basically he could die at any minute. So he could have um, like a brain bleed or something yeah. that would be very severe. And I said, but my husband is like 45 minutes away. And how am I supposed to do this by myself? Yeah. So in the end, they said that John could join us in the hospital room, but then he couldn't leave either. Right. So... Um, so he did come and join us in the hospital room. Fred didn't die then. So we did spend seven days. Or so, I mean, I said, we, we haven't even been camping because we don't want to be in a confined space together. <sighs> so we spent seven days basically in a room. John and I shared a single bed, which, you know, neither of us are small. Um, and although it was horrific, it was kind of, it was such a surreal yeah. situation. But then Fred didn't die then and um, he was then transferred to Great Ormond Street for his CAR T-cell therapy. But in Great Ormond Street, John wasn't allowed in at all. Right. So I had to be in the hospital by myself and wasn't allowed to see, uh, well, yeah, wasn't allowed to see John and obviously wasn't allowed to see Arthur. And that lasted for a while until actually Fred's birthday. And then I think... Uh, they decided that it was just not, you know, they decided that it was just not right that John wasn't allowed in. And obviously they knew how poorly Fred was. Yes, yeah. So John was allowed in to see Fred for his birthday. Obviously Arthur wasn't, Um, which was on, um, which was um, in April. And then John was allowed in sort of as a sort of day visitor between then and when Fred died. But it was just every time you thought that you'd got a handle on the situation, yeah. they just added another restriction to sort of. Yeah. And, you know, and, and and before COVID, they would say things like, you know, you must make sure you take regular breaks. You can't stay in the hospital all the time. Yes. You have to have nights at home. You have to look after yourself. And I said, well, Pat, now you're telling me that I, I can't and I yeah. don't need that at all. So that was, yeah, that was really hard. So you're going through the darkest days of your life. Your son is in hospital and you have all of these restrictions. And I understand we didn't know what we were dealing with in the early weeks and months with COVID. But looking back now, it seems so cold hearted to hear that you had to go through that. I mean, looking back now, it's just crazy, isn't it? To Yeah, but I don't think it was. I mean, and I don't see it as cold hearted. And I think by that time as well, we knew the 
particularly in Birmingham, we knew the hospital teams yeah. so well. And we were also really worried for them. And I remember we had to be moved to a different ward when Fred had COVID, the isolation ward. And because his condition was so complex, the the regular nurses didn't really know what they were doing because they were just general they weren't oncology nurses they were just general yeah. children's nurses so there were nurses who volunteered to come and look after him on the covid ward from the oncology ward and it feels like one of those like war films of you know i need a volunteer <laughs> to go but it genuinely felt like that and yeah. i think we were so grateful to them yes for essentially whether we know now what we know now or what we don't know at the time they were really putting yeah, themselves absolutely. in danger the staff were just amazing for him. weren't they during that time so i don't yeah. sort of i don't think i have i don't think i have a problem with the restrictions in that that's what we thought was required and the staff did what they could i mean even so arthur did see fred uh but the day before he went to um Great Ormond Street, Arthur was allowed in the hospital to see him. And they basically pretty much smuggled him up in a laundry basket. <laughs> he had to come up in the staff lift. Really? And like, like it was like, no one must. And it wasn't that the, the hospital must know. It was like none of the other relatives yes, must yeah. see that he's allowed in because we're not allowing anybody in. Yeah. But they allowed him to come. Because you were a special circumstance, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So Fred died in May 2020. How did you cope with the COVID funeral restrictions? Because how many could go to the funeral? So, and I'm a bit not, com no, I'm not conflicted about this. Um, so we could have 10 people at his funeral. Right. Um, and although that's awful, that was awful, I don't know how I would have coped with a proper funeral. Okay. It felt manageable. So we were allowed 10 people and also... And obviously I hadn't really thought, you never really think about, you know, whether you want your child to be buried or cremated. But the funeral director, um, who was actually, who I knew anyway, um, he said actually lots of parents, and I always assumed no one got buried anymore because you had to have bought a plot in like 1974 or something. <laughs> but he said lots of parents like a burial site rather than cremation because later they feel that they have somewhere to go. Okay. And um, our village churchyard had loads of space. Yeah. They basically have a sort of overflow field. Yeah. So um, he said he could be buried in the churchyard. And I thought, well, that feels right because it's literally two minutes walk from our house. Yeah. Um, I'm not very religious, but also that was fine because the church was shut. So we couldn't have a ceremony in the church okay. anyway. So we had a... So we had um, literally like the, just the graveside bit. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine was a, um, I had loads of friends who all were really helpful. So I had another friend of mine who was a, um, a celebrant. So I could ring her and say, could you do the service? Yeah. Oh, um, lovely. So she, so she did the service and actually Fred had, Fred had always wanted a motorbike so, which I would never let him have because it's too dangerous. Might Absolutely, kill him. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so <laughs> he'd always wanted a motorbike. So he has a motorbike hearse. And we were trying to work out how to involve other people. Yeah. Um, but also the restrictions, and it sounds ludicrous, the restrictions had changed the day before so that people could be outside and were allowed to stop. Because before that, you could be outside, but you had to sort of keep walking. Okay. You had to be exercising. Yeah. But you were allowed to be outside for other yeah. reasons other yeah. than exercising. So it meant that people could stand on the streets. Right. And so then we thought about how to get from the our house to the churchyard. Because obviously we it was too, you know, we couldn't have a car because it's literally two minutes walk. Yeah. And all I, all I could think about was uh i don't want arthur to be prince harry don't want arthur to be prince harry yeah don't want him to have to walk behind with all of these people looking yeah and i don't really want that either i no. don't want people looking at me but because arthur is remarkable arthur said that he would like to ride his bike oh how lovely so and i was like okay arthur fine i'm not riding my bike <laughs> so in the end my 
so Arthur rode his bike and then my nephew, who is in his 30s, he said, well, I will ride my bike as well with him. So yeah. that's you don't have to worry about that. And then Fred's best friend said, actually, who wasn't allowed to go to the funeral, said, actually, could I ride my bike as well? And the funeral director said, as long as you're all two metres apart, I don't really see a problem yeah. with it. So in the end, the hearse did a kind of circuit of the village. John and I legged it to the <laughs> churchyard. The hearse did a circuit of the village with Arthur and my nephew Fred's best friend, and then just other of Fred's friends just joined yeah, in. So by yeah. the time he arrived at the churchyard, there were like 15, 20 kids on their bikes. Oh, how lovely. Which was so lovely. It yeah. was like a really sad episode of The Goonies, like seen from The Goonies. Yeah. So it was really lovely. But then, and it was quite lovely, because then they just rode home because yeah. they couldn't come. They literally, the sort of hearse pulled in and they just carried on and rode home. Yeah. And so although we say, you know, we would have liked a big funeral and all of that, actually, I think it was as much as I could manage. Yeah. And I'm quite grateful that that's probably what I would have wanted. Yeah anyway yeah and not some massive thing with lots of people yeah. talking to me and yeah looking at me yeah oh well I'm I'm glad that it worked out for you Louise because you know it's one of the most difficult experiences that you can possibly go through so lockdown restrictions seriously impacted the mental health of a lot of people generally but you and your family were grieving during this time do you feel the grief experience was further complicated by the restrictions I, yes and no. I actually think it was better. Yeah. Um, in that everything stopped. So in that, and I remember actually before Fred died, when we were in Great Ormond Street and London was completely deserted, um, that um, poem from Four Weddings and a Funeral. Oh, it was called yeah. Funeral Blues. Uh, the Stop All the Clocks. Yeah. And that's what happened. Yeah. Everything stopped. And I think that gave us, although we were quite isolated because nobody could come and visit us, I think that gave us some space that yeah. we didn't have to do all of the things that were really difficult. Yeah. So go to social things or all of that stuff. Yeah. We could just be by ourselves and sort of come to terms with it. And particularly the second lockdown, the January one, I really liked that lockdown. Yeah. I thought that was really, you know, I could just sit by myself quietly yeah. and read a book. Um, because I think in the olden days, you would have that 12 months of mourning where you didn't leave the house yes. and locked yourself yeah. away. And actually, I think that's probably quite useful. And I think yeah. that was there for a reason. So although there was Arthur, it was really difficult for yeah, because he couldn't go to school, he couldn't see his friends, he was just left with us who yeah. were really broken. So for Arthur, it was, it was bad. Yeah. But for for me personally, I think I think actually just locking yourself away for a bit was quite helpful. Oh well, that's good to hear because I was thinking in terms of you know we couldn't be around friends and family who are normally our support system, aren't they? Um, but it gave you the space that you needed which is good. Now, both of our children died from a cancer diagnosis. And one aspect that I would like to change is the language surrounding cancer and its patients. I feel that framing cancer as a battle or a war, it's just not a constructive narrative. And cancer patients are often portrayed as warriors fighting a disease, with those who survive deemed as the winners and those who die are the losers. And this warlike analogy is not applied to other life-limiting um, illnesses or diseases. And when Matthew died, the use of metaphors continued and it was commonly said that he lost his battle. And I feel that this type of language is cruel to the ones who die. He wasn't a loser and Fred wasn't a loser. And this type of language diminishes the experience of those who unfortunately don't survive. 
there should be no winners or losers in this context. And I wish we could change the narrative. And just the other day, a friend of ours who's had cancer for quite a few years said that he was a fighter and that's why he was still here. And but that what does that say about our children and the others that didn't make it? Is this something you've picked up on? Oh, I hate it. Oh, Absolutely right. hate yeah. it. And I, I wrote a blog when Fred was ill, actually, um, which I sort of rewrote after he died about how just just horrific it all is. Yeah. And I think people do it because they want to be helpful. Yeah. And I think I feel it particularly because Fred was so sort of indestructible yeah. as a child. And so when he was diagnosed, now I look back now and everybody is trying to be supportive and everybody is trying to be kind. And they're all like, you know, Fred will beat this. And Fred, you know, do they know what, does cancer know what it's, who it's messing with? And, yes. And yeah. all of this stuff. And it was just, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a way, basically, people want to make themselves feel better. Yeah. And if they can talk about it as a fight, they can feel that there's some sort of control over it yes. and that there's something that can be done. And there, there isn't. And, you know, it's, we, you, you don't lose your battle with an articulated lorry. No. It's, it's, no. It's, really un, it's really unhelpful. And I think also with children, it's really unhelpful. Yeah. Because, you know, we don't send children into war. We don't send children into battle because children shouldn't be doing that. No. So why do we think that that's something that would be a helpful, would be helpful? And, you know, basically it is a battle, but it's between cancer and science. Yeah. And those are the people fight, you know, it's yes. the cancer and the doctors. Those are the people doing the fighting. Yes. And... You know, our children are just the battleground, really, yes. that this fight is being fought on if there is a, you know, if there is a fight at all. But, yeah, I find it really unhelpful. And that lost his battle. Oh, I hate that. It's just so offensive. I mean, I don't like losing Scrabble. So <laughs> I don't, I yeah. don't find it, you know, I don't find it helpful. And actually, and I don't know whether Matthew would have had this because he was older, but everyone should get them. Um, there's a brilliant charity called Beads of Courage. Beads of Courage. And Beads of Courage, you get a little pack when you're first diagnosed. And Beads of Courage, basically, you get a little bead for every single thing that you have to go through. And there are different colours. So you get a bead for every chemotherapy. You get a, ble a, a bead for every night in hospital, every blood transfusion, every blood test, every general anaesthetic. You get a special one if you've been to ICU. So it's like sort of you collect these badges, these little beads, and they all get put on a long string. So some children's beads are, you know, metres yeah. and metres and metres long. And I felt that was so helpful because it really concentrated on what children were enduring and withstanding yeah. rather than, you know, yeah, you beat it. Um, of just what the, it was a really good visual representation of what you go through, what they have been yeah. through. Because also the problem with the fighting analogy, which I think, again, makes people feel better about themselves or but doesn't really help. Is that you think that there's an end. Yeah. But there isn't an end. So even, you know, we were told all the way through, particularly with children's cancers, because their bodies are still growing. Yeah the the life limiting conditions that they will have as a result of the chemotherapy are horrific the chances of them getting cancer again are horrific the damage to their heart the damage to all of that stuff yeah. their growth their bones so it doesn't end but using that kind of he beat cancer or you yeah. know, he lost his battle just makes everybody else feel better about that. Absolutely. That there's a sort of victory in there yes. somewhere. I love the Beads of Courage. I'd not heard of those before, but because Matthew was 27 when he died, it's probably something they used for the younger generation. But it's a beautiful way, isn't it, to sort of honour what they're going through. So, yes, let's change this language, people. <laughs> now, Louise, how would you describe grief to someone who has never had a significant loss? 
I think what people don't understand, I think, is the all-encompassing nature of it and the physical nature of it as well as the emotional. So it is not just being a bit sad or being very sad or crying a lot. It has such a it has such an effect on your entire life and every every part of it. And I think and I say this is it's not my description. I think it actually C.S. Lewis said that uh, it's like an amputation. Yeah. And it really is on a metaphorical level. There is now a bit of me missing that will always be missing. But also in the as a as a metaphor, the kind of for the stages of grief, you have the section where like literally you're bleeding and you've got this open wound that needs tending to um, that you need to recover from. But then after that, you need to learn, you know, you need to learn how to walk again. And everything is difficult and uncomfortable and painful. Yeah. And that's never going, uh, you know, you might get a bit better about walking with a prosthetic leg or with crutches or, you know, you might make adaptations to your house, but you're never going to be the the bit healthy, two-legged person yeah. that that you once were. And I think people, yeah, I think people don't understand all of the aspects of your life that that yeah. affects. So you say that writing helped you to come to terms with your grief and and writing certainly played a big part in helping me process my grief experience too. But what other things helped you? Um, I got a dog. Which I have to say to my listeners is here sitting beautifully quiet at the moment. <laughs> you may have heard dusting moving around earlier, but um, perfectly behaved dog and beautiful too. Yes. So, uh, yes, Dustin is my grief spaniel. Um, I I find him really helpful. I think he um, there was a brilliant book, um, which I thought, actually, I'm really annoyed because I would have loved to have nicked that title called Everyone Died. So I got a dog. Right. <laughs> and, I like um, it. Um, so he's really helpful because I think he is very emotionally supportive. He makes me get out every day and go yeah. for a walk. Um, and also he sort of injects a bit of uh, Fred shaped chaos into yeah, my life yeah. by constantly being where he shouldn't be. Um, but I think I so so writing I found really helpful. Walking I found really helpful. I've done a lot of just walking, uh, particularly in that first summer. I did a lot of walking by myself, getting terribly lost, yeah. trying to find my way home. Um, so I found that helpful. Um, other people, um, I think, and I don't know whether this is something that is true more for mothers than fathers, uh, but I rely an awful lot on my other bereaved mothers. Yeah. We have a really good, um, is yeah, a really good support system yeah. that we just can, you know, it's not even that we talk about things in particular depth, but every now and again, there'll be a WhatsApp that just sort of goes, yeah. Ah! Yeah. And then we're like, yeah. You just get each other. It's like your tribe, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I don't I don't know what else. I mean, I think in the first year, year and a half, and everybody just finds their own way through. In the year, first year and a half, I was really quite, I would say I was quite active. So I um, I did lots of writing. I set up a charity. I ran a half marathon. I did all of this yeah. kind of very proactive, yeah, very stay busy, of keep busy, positive, yeah. busy things. And then I sort of just a bit ran out and um, just sort of ran out of steam. And I have a, a shorthand with a, a friend of mine whose son um, also died. Fred and Frank were in hospital together. And after every sort of really positive thing, we'll just sort of send a message to each other going, yep, still dead. Yeah. And I think that was quite hard to accept that actually it doesn't matter what you do. It's still going to be dead. Still yeah. going to be rubbish. And so I think that was then definitely came a bit of a slump. Yeah. But allowing the slumps, I think, are really important. I think yeah. I give myself a bit of a hard time that I am not, you know, trying hard enough, doing well enough. Yeah. 
And sometimes I have to just say, no, it's just rubbish. Just lie down. Absolutely. It's just allowing those um, feelings to be there, sit with them for a while, knowing that it will pass. You've come through the worst part in those early weeks and months. And this is grief, isn't it? It, it's and I I feel I don't know about you Louise I, I feel like um it's part of Matthew that's still with me and I don't want to lose that Does yeah that feel, absolutely yeah and I think also there's a real difference um which is something I come to terms with I think there's a real difference between grief and trauma yeah and I think you have to sort of deal with them both separately and I think even people whose children have cancer and they survive, they still have to deal with the trauma of that. Yes. That's still, they still have a full bucket yeah. of does that. Does it make it magically go away yeah. because they survived, does it? Yeah. Um, and I, so I find that, yeah, the two things are very different. But also there's a lot, and so people, lots, lots of people talk about dealing with trauma and there's all these things you can do. And, and I certainly try to do a lot of that, but also... I'm like, actually, no, I didn't want, that's my child. The yeah. the trauma that I have is his and I don't want to get rid of it. Thank you very much. I'm quite happy with it where it is. Yeah. Because that was our experience and that was the experience that I had with him. Yes. And those things that we went through, we went through together. Yes. And I don't particularly want to sort of not think about it or get over it. Yeah, in it's because Fred's still part of your life and that's part of... The whole thing, isn't it? It's, so you can't just let that go. But can you tell us about your charity? Do you find this helps you? I do. I find it helps because um, it gives me an excuse to talk about Fred a lot yeah. and share his pictures and see him. And it gives me um, an excuse for other people to know about him and for other people to for other people to talk about him. So I think it's quite a positive yes. focus. Um, it it feels important because it feels that you know other other families won't have to go through that and that and that will be his yeah, legacy absolutely and that's really important but then some days you know be perfectly honest it is sometimes it is a bit of a double edged sword so we're doing um we're funding three research projects at the moment and there's a couple of special named fund there's lots of special named funds and they've grouped a couple of them together to fund these research projects so another really good friend of mine runs um live kindly live loudly for her daughter ruby um so it's really nice that those are together yeah. and that they're sort of doing this yeah. together um but also it is a really double-edged sword because you're like well actually this is going to be the thing that could have made the difference but yes. it's too late for our children yeah and you almost kind of <laughs> and obviously you don't because you work really hard to raise all of this yeah. money but um at the same time you do have to sort of go oh bugger yeah i totally get that so how is your book coming on um yeah okay i do it in a bit of fits and starts um as i say i find it i do find it very helpful but also it's quite hard to sort of you have to sort of ease your way into it and ease your way out of it. So, again, I'm trying to not give myself a hard time about not doing that thing of, you know, you must write a thousand words a day uh, <laughs> because I do then need to have a nap and uh, process things a yeah. little bit. But but, I do, but I'm finding it really helpful. And even if nothing ever sort of, you know, I will have written it and that will yes. have, that's important. Absolutely. That I, have, I have written it down. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. So you can definitely read it. <laughs> <laughs> so did you find people were unsure how to be around you and not know what to say after Fred died? Did you find awkwardness with oh, other people? It's hideous. <laughs> and I think that some people really surprise you in good ways and bad ways. Yes. So some people just can't cope with it at all. And there are some people, and lockdown made this a bit more difficult, to be fair. But there are some people who were friends who I've never spoken to since because they just disappeared and yeah. never returned. Um, but people are really uncomfortable. They don't want to look at it. They don't want to think about it. And they want to, or they just want to make everything better and they can't. Yes. And that's really, yeah. and that is really difficult to people. But I find it, I think, aside from 
obviously Fred's death and missing him very much. I find that a real loss. Yeah. The loss of people being comfortable around you and being someone who is just, you know, yeah. easy to deal with and that you don't have to manage. And I find that really difficult that yeah. I'm now someone who needs special care. Yes, yeah. Well, one of the hardest questions is, and you probably know what's come in, is when you meet someone for the first time and you get chatting and then they ask, do you have any children? I still struggle to answer this question. What do you say when you get asked this? Well, the problem is I've been asked about it. I've been asked that question and I kind of prepare my answer, think I have an answer prepared, but every time people ask it in a different way that that answer doesn't fit. <laughs> so, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I actually use it as quite a good sort of barometer of people. Yeah. So... Our first, actually, our first holiday without Fred, uh, I met a lovely woman who's, who was there without her children. Yeah. Um, because her children were grown up. And so, obviously, we were there with Arthur. So she didn't say, do you have any more children? She said, um, is Arthur the only one that you've brought with you? Oh. Meaning, do you have an older child at home that you've yeah. left at home? I immediately burst into tears. Yeah. <laughs> sort of to try and get this answer out. But she was absolutely lovely. Yeah. And I think the people who can stay in the people who can stay with the discomfort of that yeah. are the are the good ones. Yeah. And then there are people who run away. But actually also on that holiday, Arthur, again, who is amazing. Some Arthur went to like the kids club and someone asked him if he had any brothers and sisters and oh, he said God. no. Yeah. And then he came back sort of for lunch and said, that feels really wrong. That feels really, I feel oh, really upset about that. Yeah. I don't want to, I, that doesn't feel right. And so went back after lunch and told them yeah. that actually he did have a brother and his yeah. brother had died. And they were lovely. But that kind of finding your way through it's really difficult. And and also, I don't know how it goes as you move on through time, because, you know, it's been three years since Fred died and I still feel like he has just died. Yes. But then in 20 years time, if someone asks how many children I've got, I'm still going to have I'm still going to have two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's. You know, it, it sort of feels how long? How long are you allowed to keep bringing the dead one up? Yeah, or do you yeah, just exactly. carry on doing that? I totally get that. And you that. know, how? Yeah. At what level of social situation do you want to get into yeah. that conversation? Because when you um, do get into that conversation, then you see the horror on their faces. Then you feel you have to rescue that person. Say, oh no, yeah, it's, absolutely. Oh no, it's uh, fine. Honestly, whole, yeah, yeah. Or you get, and, and I, I really, really object to the head tilts. <laughs> <laughs> I want to slap people when they do that. <laughs> don't, don't, tilt, don't tilt your head at me. So what do you feel the right words to express your condolences to somebody? Because it's so hard to get it right, isn't it? I mean, I don't think there are... I mean, I do swear, I do swear quite a lot, so I'm always happy with people swearing. Um, <laughs> I don't really think there are any. I think the problem is when people try to... Uh, sort of make the best of it or try and say something yeah. that is supposed to be comforting because it isn't comforting. They have died. It's really shit. Yeah. And I think as long as people are happy to be with you in that discomfort yeah. and not be looking for an escape hatch, I think that's really yeah. important. I had um, a, a friend who, she was, she isn't actually a friend. Her son was at school with uh with Fred so she's a playground friend and uh, very soon after Fred died she literally she saw me in Sainsbury's she ran up to me and she said I've got nothing to say but I didn't want to not say anything at all yeah. so I thought I'd just come and say hello and then next time it might not be weird Yeah. and then she ran yeah. off again and I was I so like grateful that. to her. Yes, more people should say more things like that. More people should say things to that because <laughs> yeah. there is no perfect no. response. So, you know, I'm sorry, that shit. Yeah. I think if that's something that you're comfortable with, 
is, is as good as you're is as good as you're gonna yeah. get. But the platitudes are just really annoying. They are, and the sort of yeah, all of these things to dress it up and make it better just doesn't. Um, yeah, because nothing doesn't anybody work. says is going to make you feel better. It's not their responsibility to make you feel better. But you know, even if they say something that's clumsy, it's better than they completely ignoring it. Yeah. But I used to think that saying. I'm sorry for your loss. How are you feeling? Was the safest option because you're acknowledging the loss and you're giving that person an opportunity to talk if they want to. But then somebody said to me the other day, I, I bloody hate that saying because my daughter isn't lost. She's dead. And I thought, do you know what? <laughs> yeah. It's so right. Yeah. It is so hard to get it right. It so is hard. And what you your friend say... said to you was perfect. Yeah. And you can't say, I'm sorry your daughter's dead because that does no. feel a bit brutal. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, sorry for your loss is... Uh, no, I mean, Fred was getting lost all the time. So. <laughs> but actually, yeah. and also the how are you, the how are you I find difficult. Yeah. Especially if it comes with a head yeah. tilt. Um, yeah. Because obviously the answer is rubbish. Yeah. How I, used, are you? I used to say, oh, well, fine, thank you. How are you? And just deflect it straight back. Yeah. Don't ask me. Don't yeah. be nice to me. Don't be kind to me because I'll just cry. Yeah. <laughs> but what I do quite like and which I do try to use with other people um, is a sort of variation of how is today yeah that's a good one I so like how that. is today is a nice is it just gives you more options yes so you because then if you want to sorry dustin is not licking the microphone <laughs> <laughs> um it gives you more options that if you really want to say actually today is really difficult yeah you've got that option there or you can say um yeah, fine. Because actually, when people say, how are you? They want you to say, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. How are Absolutely. you? Yeah. They don't yeah. want to know. Yeah. They're not asking because they yeah. want to know. Yeah. They're just being polite. <laughs> <laughs> so, Louise, can you recommend any books or films or podcasts or groups to support people going through grief? So, uh, I find books really, I find books really helpful, not necessarily books on grief. But I found reading really helpful. Yeah. I really liked being transported somewhere else, listening to someone yeah. else. Um, and the same with and the same with films. And there and films are tricky because sometimes they can be quite cathartic, and sometimes they can just be absolutely traumatizing and harrowing. Yeah. Um, one of my one of my favorite films since I was like thirteen uh, has been Steel Magnolias. Haven't watched that since. That's ruined. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but some one day I might watch it and it might be really helpful. Yeah. Um, there's a really good book actually that I read called and it's Megan Devine. Oh, I like Megan Devine. She's yes. lovely. Yeah. Um, and it's called It's Okay That You're Not Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Her book is one. brilliant, and she also has an excellent like Facebook feed and Instagram feed. Yeah. She does a writing course. Pretty sure she's, she's got a She's really good at social media, isn't yeah. she? Yeah. She is really good. Really good. So I found that book really helpful. Um, lots of people sent me, uh, is it grief is a thing with feathers? Feathers. I hated that. That wasn't helpful at all. Oh, my daughter loved that one. Well, exactly. Strange, isn't it? Um, yeah. What are the, oh, I also read, um, A Year of Magical Thinking by Jane Didion. I did love that one. Yeah. That one I really liked. Um, I read Hamnet, uh, my year Farrell book about the death of Hamlet's son which I thought I was going to hate because uh, Maggie O'Farrell has not lost a child, to my knowledge. Um, so I thought I was going to hate it um, because she would just get it really wrong. But she really didn't. It's really beautiful uh, and really lovely. Um, so I re could recommend that. And I'm trying to think. I'm sure I did a lot of the books I read, certainly in the first year. I read a lot of books and I have no memory of any of them. Yeah. Because yeah. I've got really no memory of anything at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll certainly make a note of these in the show notes so people can check them out. So for people who have just lost a loved one or for other people who are maybe feel stuck in grief, do you have any words of wisdom you could share to maybe help them loosen their grief in some way? Oh, I think I really wish I did. Yeah. But I think it will, um, but it will shift and it won't go away and time does not heal all wounds, but it will change. Yeah. And I think on the days that are really bad, I think 
you know that not every day is going to be like that. Yeah. And and it's a little bit I, um, that there will be sort of glimpses of like joy. And that isn't like, you know, unbridled happiness. That's like a really enjoying a really good cup of tea. Yeah. There will be glimpses of joy. And over time, those will get more. And yeah. so they'll never completely. I think. I didn't understand, I suppose, as much as I do now, that it's possible to have joy and sadness at the same time yes. and feel both of them together yeah. and that be OK. Yeah. You think that you're never going to feel happy about anything else ever again. And in some ways that's true, yeah. but in other ways it isn't. And yeah. you can just feel both things at the same time. And actually, and I do feel this, your lovely husband uh, sent me an email just after Fred died and said that the uh, for, and I th thought about it a lot because he said the first three years were the hardest and I read it and I'm like bloody hell I'm in like week two <laughs> did you need to hear that then <laughs> I'm not sure this is helpful but actually no I really did um I really did need to hear it because then like you know four months later I'd be like oh, I was like, oh no no Bill yeah. The, the, the first three years were the hardest so yeah <laughs> just crack on and it was fred's third anniversary a couple of months ago and and i had forgotten about it um but, but then it was fred's third anniversary a couple of months ago and i thought no that's actually true because i don't feel better now particularly but i feel that something has shifted i yeah. feel that there is a different you know a different not necessarily different phase, but yeah. a different setting yes. to that yeah. grief. And I think people expect you to get over it. Yes. Or just oh, just stop crying. Um, but people <sighs> expect you to move on yeah. quickly and you you can't. But as long as you kind of accept that this is going to be with you for a really, really long time, yeah. I think it's then easier to manage because you can sort of not expect too much of yourself i think it's just really nice for people to hear that it's you know it's a, it's a good message for people that are in a dark place in the early stages of grief particularly that's you know how they're feeling now it will ease it's not yeah. always going to feel that bad and i think also i remember i made very i think i was very determined and i remember saying this to a friend very soon after fred died that I think also, and this sound, I don't mean this to sound cold or heartless or judgmental at all, but I think some of it is a choice that you have to make. Yeah. And I think I made a choice that I don't want Fred to be the reason that my life is ruined. No. No. And I don't, I think I, I think I owe him. You know, all of our children are, hopefully, all of our children are the best things that happen to us. Yes. And yeah. Fred remains that. Yeah. So where are you and your family in your grief journey now? And how is Arthur doing? Um, I mean, Arthur, I keep saying Arthur is remarkable, but he really is. I don't, um, Arthur is, Arthur is doing really well. I worry for him because I'm his mother and that's my job. Yeah, that's so what I'm, mums do. I'm very conscious that that is not going to... And not, you know, it's difficult, but, you know, Fred's... Arthur's relationship with Fred will change over time. So now Arthur is the same age that Fred was when he died. Yeah. Arthur is now older than Fred. That brings its complications. Yeah. As he gets older, there will be ways that he misses him in a different way to the the grief that he had when he yes. was a little boy i don't but also i don't really feel like i can speak for him yeah. he he does incredibly well i think we talk about fred a lot we talk about him not necessarily in a griefy way uh but he's very much part of our daily conversation yes. fred like this fred didn't like that do you remember when fred did this yeah he's still very much part of um part of our family 
And it's good to hear their names being spoken, isn't it? We want to hear them. They're still part of our lives. So, Louise, what are your thoughts about the afterlife? So, I'm not religious and I'm a bit cross about that because I can see why being religious is really very helpful (laughs) in these situations. But I'm not religious. But I do allow myself... uh, I do allow myself some thoughts about the afterlife. So one thing that I have with a couple of my uh, bereaved mother friends is um, we like to think that they all have a flat together. I like that. So they all have a flat. And when uh, Taylor Hawkins from the Foo Fighters tragically died, uh, me and my husband, I'm like, well, he's moved in upstairs. OK, I like that. Yeah. Um so, and we will often send each other messages, like, you know, sort of, you know, about them all watching Glastonbury and getting pizzas yeah. in and, <laughs> and, that, and that kind of thing. So I find that uh, that very helpful. Um, I also lost my parents when I was quite young. So I was already quite sort of, you know, grief experienced before Fred died. Yes. And I do, and, I, and they died before Fred was born. So they never, they never uh, met him. But I do kind of like to think that they also live around the corner and that there's just this nice sort of, yeah, they're just all having a nice time. Yeah, I like that. So do you believe our loved ones can give us signs? Um, I don't... uh... I don't know. So there's that phase where you just see feathers everywhere, wherever you go. <laughs> and then you realise there's just quite a lot of dead birds about. You know? yes. <laughs> it really works. I, so I like uh, big scenery. So I was in Yorkshire last week. I love a big view. Yeah. And I don't. So and and I do love a rainbow. Yeah. So I like lo- there have been quite a few occasions where. There has I where basically there have been quite a few occasions where I have needed to see a rainbow and I have seen one. Um, I like to think that uh, sometimes I and I do love like stormy clouds. Yeah. And sometimes um, I do like to think that Fred has uh, delivered stormy clouds really just to be awkward and spoil things in uh, making his presence <laughs> felt. But I love big skies and big scenery and, yeah, yeah, weather. So if I think, if I think Fred sends me signs, I think it's through the weather. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So if you could give Fred a message now, what would you like to say? I actually, I thought about this on the way here. Um, And I was going to, I was going to say, don't ask that question. Um, But I thought actually, in terms of how we all do things differently I thought actually it was quite interesting because obviously you have written a whole book about your letters to Matthew and what you would say to him and I do have things that I would say to Fred but I feel that they are very much mine yes and I think that I have found it really important that I have a bit of my relationship with Fred going forward if you see what I mean that I don't share because that's all I've got that's yes. the only thing that there is really um because I I feel like with don't look down and, and writing and all of this stuff, I've sort of given him to the world in that very grandiose way so um yeah so I do have things that I would say to Fred but I'm not going to tell you what they are and that's absolutely <laughs> fine with me and Louise I think that is a beautiful way to end this episode so thank you for being a guest on my podcast today thank you for bringing dusty and he's been beautifully behaved and um thank you thank you losing a child is undoubtedly one of the most devastating experiences a parent can endure no matter the child's age however when it comes to losing a young child the dynamic of grief takes on a distinct set of challenges. The dreams and aspirations that were once filled with the promise of their future suddenly become shattered hopes, leaving parents grappling with an overwhelming sense of emptiness and incompleteness. Moreover, the loss feels unjust, as these young lives are often seen as innocent and untainted by the complexities and hardships of the world. The grieving process varies for everyone, 
but writing has always been Louise's passion and she has found it a vital way to come to terms with her grief in order to move forward. Finding a way to move forward can be difficult, but we can pay tribute to our loved ones by living our lives to the fullest. Living our best life is not a mere act of remembrance, it's a testament to the bond we share with our loved ones. It's a commitment to embrace joy, seek fulfilment and make a positive impact on the world around us. By embodying the qualities that made our loved ones special, we can honour their memory and ensure that their legacy lives on. Louise is evidence that life can go on after the death of a child and Fred will live on in the hearts and minds of everyone who knew him. If you would like to donate to Fred Bennett's Don't Look Down Fund, please check out the link in the show notes. You will also find other links for information about Louise, her blogs and her work. Thank you for listening to this episode of A Gift for Grief. Please feel free to share it with your friends and family and let's encourage others to become more grief literate. If you're struggling with your grief or worried about your mental health, please do speak to your doctor. If you would like to join me on my social media groups, check out the show notes for all the links and I look forward to connecting with you next time. The music on this podcast was written and recorded by Matthew Bates and can be found on his two albums, Fight Back and Kaleidoscope.